Hello and welcome to Zoe Shorts, the bite-sized podcast where we discuss one topic around science and nutrition. I'm Jonathan Wolf, and today I'm joined by Dr. Will Bulsewich. And today's subject is constipation. You probably think constipation is simply infrequent bowel movements. However, it may surprise some people to hear that you could have a bowel movement every day and still be constipated. What? That's crazy. Are you telling me that everything we know about constipation is wrong? Well, Jonathan, maybe not, maybe not everything, but constipation is about so much more than just how often we poop. I, I think we can dispel some of the misconceptions about constipation and empower these listeners to better bowel movements. Well, let's not be really slow to get to the punchline. So let's get into it. Before we start, I think we do need to be clear, like what is the gold standard for how often you should be going to the toilet? From some of the research that I've looked at, I can see that medical professionals suggest anything from three times each day to three times each week can be considered healthy, which is an enormous range. So Will, before we go any further, like what is a healthy frequency and what is therefore the textbook definition of constipation? The formal definition, just to be clear for constipation, is having fewer than three bowel movements per week. Now, let me just say, like as a gastroenterologist, I actually find this definition to be too narrow and simple. It doesn't cover all the forms of constipation that I've seen in the clinic. Constipation is incredibly common, and there's been some recent data that suggests that a quarter of people worldwide have at one point reported constipation symptoms. Now, I just want to reassure anyone listening that Will isn't just a rogue gastroenterologist off to you know, redefine this whole thing on his own um, and sort of expand the definition of the problem so he can find you know, lots more patients who didn't even realize they needed him. Um, a team at you know, our King's College London uh, published a paper in 2019 that said a new definition for constipation is needed. Uh, and I took a look at this and it says they found that the public's understanding of constipation differs dramatically from that of doctors and other medical professionals. Yeah, and I think that this disconnect is problematic. Um, you know, basically you are disrupting the relationship between the patient and the doctor, and this ultimately will lead to low satisfaction rates. In fact, they found that almost half of the patients who have these constipation issues say that they aren't satisfied with the treatment that they're receiving for those issues. And you know, further, the survey conducted by King's College, it actually indicated that a third of the patients, they weren't even able to recognize the signs of their own constipation when they were describing their symptoms. They didn't even make the connection between their symptoms and constipation. So when I, you know, I find that really interesting because when I think of constipation, I think it's really simple. I have a, a like a very simple image in my mind of spending a long time on the toilet, probably unable to pass, you know, a stool, a poop at all. Um, so that's what it would mean to me. Maybe combined with the feeling of not being able to go at all, you know, other times during the day. So maybe like normally I am going every day, but now, you know, I'm, I'm on the third day of my holiday and, you know, nothing's happened or like I'm going and I can't sort of fully empty myself. And I would say, honestly, that you just summarized many of the forms of constipation that can exist that don't necessarily meet into this definition of less than three bowel movements per week. Those are absolutely signs to look for, Jonathan. And it could also even include, believe it or not, the idea of not feeling the desire to go or not even feeling the instinct like, hey, I, I have this urge. I feel like I have to go. So look, none of this sounds like fun. And I think many of us listening have experienced some of those symptoms at some point, even if they're only rare or other people, you know, this is something they're living with um, all the time. Now, I remember from some of our previous podcasts, Will, that gas and bloating can be linked to lots of different issues related to our gut. So is constipation one of those? Uh, absolutely, Jonathan. And I think this is one of the important points that I want to get across to the listeners at home, that... Um, gas and bloating is one of the telltale signs of constipation. Almost 100% of people who are constipated will experience gas and bloating. But there are also some other symptoms that people could be on the lookout for. And this would include the uh, distended or protuberant belly, like, you know, men who look like they're pregnant, something like that. Um, nausea, loss of appetite, fullness after meals. 
people often will have a crampy abdominal pain and that um, discomfort can actually come in waves and it can be extremely intense. Like some of these people think it's so intense that they have some sort of surgical issue when in fact it's just constipation. And you know, the other thing too is fatigue. So this can be another common symptom of constipation. And so if we're looking at all those problems, um, how, how do you actually diagnose constipation? It sounds like it's such a sort of broad mix of things. Yeah, it is a broad mix of symptoms, but you know, the first step is that you have to prove that the person is actually retaining stool and backing up. And the uh, perhaps easiest way to do this is with an imaging test. So this could be an X-ray or a CAT scan, or there's a test called a SITS marker study. Um, but the important point is that even though you can demonstrate that a person has constipation with these tests, you can't prove what the cause of the constipation is based upon that test alone. And so there are many potential causes for constipation beyond just slow movement of the intestines. And over the last two decades or so, we've developed sort of new testing that's pretty impressive and allows us to really get to the heart of understanding these problems. So, Will, tell me, tell me about these tests. Okay, so first of all, Jonathan, is a test called anorectal manometry. And basically, this test measures the sphincter, uh, the, the pressures of the anal sphincter mus muscles, the sensation that people have in their rectum, and the reflexes that are in play as a part of the pelvic bowl in terms of relaxing and having a good normal bowel movement. And so when we do when they do this test in rectal manometry, they will insert a small catheter into the person's bottom. And once that's in there, the patient is guided through a series of exercises that are monitored by a machine. So look, I'm sure this I sounds say, fantastic. So, sounds like sounds wonderful. Well, I'm yeah. sure you have people like signing up for this experiment. I'm really selling it right now, aren't I? <laughs> yeah. So it's but you know, I think that the important point though with this is first of all, it's painless. Uh, it is not something where people have extreme discomfort. It's done in privacy. Um, and for those who need it, this test can be completely life-changing. So it allows us to understand how your bottom functions and whether or not you can properly squeeze and relax your, not just the anal sphincter, but also the pelvic floor muscles. So these are very important parts of this. So it sort of allows you to understand if actually maybe there's something to do with you know, like your muscles. It's got nothing to do with, I don't know, your microbiome or your your diet. You know, it could be something completely different is what you're saying. Yeah, and these things can affect the microbiome, but um, the problem that exists is actually in the way that the muscles function. So much like I could hurt my shoulder, Jonathan, and not be able to raise my arm above my head. And the way that I fix that and restore function to the muscle is not by popping a pill, but instead by rehabilitating the muscle. The same type of issue can happen at our bottom. So before going too deep, because I can see that we could spend a long time talking about this, that like that's one interesting area. What, what was the other test that you talked about? Okay, real quick. The second test is called defecography. Um, it's otherwise known as evacuation proctography. And basically, this is a procedure where they use an x-ray machine or an uh, MRI to visualize the rectum and the anal canal during a simulated bowel movement. And the point here is that this type of test, it's an imaging test that is done during a simulated bowel movement. It can reveal abnormalities that exist that would be missed by other tests, such as a colonoscopy. So I think that's amazing. Um, those are like incredibly high tech tests that I think most people, including I, have you know never heard of. Now, I think a lot of listeners are gonna say, well, hang on a minute, that all sounds very expensive and high tech. Um, and surely constipation is just really easily treatable. You go down to the pharmacy, you get a fiber supplement. Um, you know, are any of these tests really necessary, Will? These tests should not be the first thing that you do once you realize that it's constipation. These tests really are reserved for the patient who is failing traditional therapy. And I think that, you know, now may be a good time for us, Jonathan, to kind of explore how I would recommend that my patients approach constipation in the very beginning, starting with the most basic stuff. Sounds like a brilliant idea. So basically, you come in, you, you've said, you know, I'm, I'm a doctor, you thought it was constipation, okay, I'm willing to accept it's constipation, even if it doesn't quite follow the rule that like you're managing three and a half a week, so whatever. 
And they're like, okay, great. Thank you for your definition. Now, could you actually help me to do something about it? What do you say, Will? Yeah, and I, I think from my perspective, you know, it's sort of common for people to head straight to the pharmacy to pick up whatever sort of medication is available to treat their constipation. And, and sadly, in many cases in our healthcare systems, the doctors will recommend these things. But I personally think that we need to start with diet and lifestyle first. This should be our first step. And there are simple steps such as increasing our intake of whole plant foods, where by doing that, by increasing our whole plant food intake, we are actually increasing our fiber intake. And when we reduce our ultra processed food intake in combination with this, we ultimately are guiding ourselves towards a number one, more microbiome friendly diet. Number two, a dietary pattern that can improve the health of our bowel movements, including potentially resolving mild constipation. So I kind of feel like, whoa, 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 let's not jump to the medications first. We may get there. And one of the things that I've been really struck at looking at all the um, the members who go through the Zoe program and they report back on sort of changes in their health is there's a lot of people who've been reporting significant reduction in constipation. And I'm struck by that because it wasn't something that any of the scientists were talking about as they were working to optimize this guidance. So it's a sort of really, unex for me, really unexpected byproduct. All of these people are following these programs personalized to them, um, focused really on their long-term health. And then they're coming back, you know, quite early on in this program saying, well, like, wow, like my constipation has got much better. I guess, are you surprised by that? And, and can you help to explain why that's happening? So I was going to say, I'm actually not that surprised to be totally honest with you. And what's interesting about it is that the Zoe program was developed um, using the microbiome and um, looking at things like blood sugar, blood fat. We're, we're attempting to improve the health of the microbiome. Now, these microbes, they are connected to our bowel movements, to our digestive health, our digestive function, and to all these other facets of human health. And so when we, when we develop a program intended to sort of improve the gut health towards blood sugar, blood fat, we're simultaneously improving the health of these microbes in general. And this leads to these benefits that we see that like, you know, look, we can say it was unintended. This is an unintended benefit that a person has better bowel movements and improves their digestive health and reduces their constipation. But this is exactly the way that this is supposed to work, which is that when we enhance the quality of our diet and we enhance the health of our gut, we will see better bowel movements. We will improve constipation. We will have less symptoms. That's a beautiful thing. And Will, I'd actually like to circle back to something that you said um, earlier, because you said right at the beginning, um, something that blew my mind, which is you can go to the toilet every day and still be constipated, which is I'm like, well, no. <laughs> so can you can you explain uh, what's going on there? Yeah. So I've had so many patients that I, I literally have to frame this to them like, I need you to trust me on this. Let me explain the whole thing before you tell me that I'm wrong. Because it's hard for people to believe that they could poop every day and still be constipated. And in fact, there are many examples of how this can work. So I just want to kind of go through a couple of the patterns if that's okay. Of course. So, you know, one of the issues is it could be that there's incomplete evacuations. Like, when you go, you're not really empty. Sometimes the way that this works is that you're passing these little small nuggets. And ultimately, these people, because they're not completely emptying, they're backing up. There's even some people who actually have diarrhea, believe it or not. And seriously, that seems counterintuitive because, you know, I think about diarrhea is like really emptying everything else. So how can you have constipation and diarrhea at the same time? Yeah. So, I mean, it seems like they're diametrically opposed and they're not supposed to be connected in any way. Um, so it's going to surprise some people, but believe it or not, severe constipation can actually manifest with diarrhea. And the, what we actually call this, Jonathan, is overflow diarrhea. And by the way, we should have said right at the beginning, 
we really hope you're not listening to this podcast while you're eating. I, I should have put like a sort of uh, trigger. We'll have to put a trigger warning on at the beginning. So tell us about overflow diarrhea for any of our listeners who are still with us at this point, Will. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> as I've said before, and I'll say it again, I am far too comfortable talking about these things. I could do it all day. Um, if you take this person who has overflow diarrhea and you were to perform an x-ray and take a look inside what's happening inside their body, what you would actually see is that they are severely constipated and what and they have a hard column of stool. This column of stool is actually backing up. It's stuck. So it's sort of like a like a you know like a log jam um, in the colon. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, for back of a lack of a better expression, there's a log jam. I mean, basically, the solid stuff starts backing up. And then the liquid is the part that actually can sneak through. It gets through the cracks and the crevices and it comes and descends down to your bottom. And then unfortunately it explodes out as a, you know, diarrhea. So, you know, naturally the inclination for this person who just experienced ex explosive diarrhea, they, um, their inclination is to treat this with anti-diarrhea medicine, which makes it worse. And that's because the problem is not diarrhea, it's severe constipation. Amazing. And I think we, we will, I'm sure, have a whole discussion about, you know, diarrhea and things like this at another point. So, you know, Will, I know you could speak about constipation uh, for hours, um, but I think since we like to have a, like a regular movement, I guess we don't want to be slowed down and backed up on this topic for too long. That's my better attempt at a constipation joke. <laughs> um, so, well done. Thank you. I am not sure I've managed it yet, but well, uh, you know, <laughs> I'll think long and hard for next time. I'll keep working on it. So, um, you know, if you've been listening to this and you're in that amazing, you know, quarter of the world's population that has constipation from time to time, um, and you could give our listeners like a few key takeaways from, you know, what is designed to be a, a short podcast, you know, what would you like to tell them at the end of this? First thing you have to do is ask the question, is this constipation? If you suffer with digestive symptoms and any change in bowel habits, ask yourself the question, is this constipation? And open your mind to the possibility that you could poop every day and be constipated, that you could have diarrhea and be constipated. Once you answer that question, step one, start with diet. Move towards a more whole foods, high fiber diet with less ultra processed foods. These improvements in dietary quality, as we discussed, Jonathan, and as we've seen in the Zoe users, many times will lead to improvements in constipation and more broadly improvements in your bowel movements. Now, when we're doing this, a couple of easy things that you can do, low hanging fruit, drink more water, stay hydrated, and move your body. When you move, your bowels will move. Anything as simple as just taking a walk through your neighborhood is more than acceptable. So it's not like you have to go and do some massive exercise. No. You're actually just saying like, walk around more. I'm just saying, get off the couch. Like you just, let's start with the basics and let's just move your body around. Now, there are some specific foods that I wanna just kind of do a quick tip of the cap to because these specific foods we have found to be beneficial for constipation. And this includes kiwi fruit, prunes, figs, chia seeds, and flax seeds. And well, I have to ask a question about this because, um, again, I'm thinking about my my three year old who is maybe not as regular as she should be. Um, she's luckily a bit too young to be embarrassed by this conversation on 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 the podcast. And and prune does seem to be quite magical. Um, I'm guessing that is more than just because it's a high fiber food. What what is going on with something like that? Yeah, so even even we are not prune juice, which many people have heard this trick. And actually, I use this with my seven month old Jonathan. So we're we're cut from the same cloth as dads uh, in some of the stuff we're dealing with. So uh, prune juice works pretty well, and we think that this is partially the fiber content, but also that prunes contain specific ingredients such as sorbitol, and the sorbitol helps to draw water into the intestines, and that water helps to lubricate the stool and, and sort of keep it moving through. So this is just another example how food is packed with all of these different chemicals that really have an impact on our body beyond just, you know, calories and raw numbers of fiber and, and carbohydrate. Is that what you're saying? There's, this is really is like a sort of, you know, a very particular sort of medicinal properties. Absolutely. But the beautiful thing is that you can be eating these prunes and they, they I mean, honestly, I think they taste very good. But even beyond that, it's more than just whether or not you poop. There's more benefit to your health beyond that. So I think, you know, those are some of the things that I think about and the reasons why I say that we should opt for our diet first, because don't, you know, don't try to out supplement a bad diet. 
I just don't think that that's a strategy that's going to win. Instead, let's optimize diet first. And then if there is a requirement for supplements, then we can add that on the back end. Um, but, you know, Jonathan, beyond sort of that sort of conversation, the last point that I want to drive home to the listeners is that if you are struggling to have a good bowel movement and you've tried these things and you've worked with your doctor, that's where these tests, the anal rectum manometry and the defecography, that's where they come in. They can be extremely helpful and life-changing for people in terms of guiding therapy. And I guess we didn't say this explicitly, but but we should do that, of course, and you, you say this often, Will, right? Like all of these conversations are things that you should be having, you know, together with your doctor and making sure, um, as always, that you, you know, you, you know, you're treating the right thing and there isn't something more serious. 110 percent. We're, we're here to empower people. We're hoping, you know, my hope, of course, is that the listener takes some of this information and that it's important and transformative for them. But that's, of course, with the assistance of their healthcare provider. Brilliant. Well, I think I learned a great deal, including that I don't even understand what constipation is, which is always a great start to learning more. Will, thank you so much. If you have listened to this uh, conversation, maybe you are interested in uh, dealing with constipation and maybe you're just interested in your health, then you know, think about trying Zoe's personalized nutrition program. You can get 10% off by going to joinzoe.com slash podcast. I'm Jonathan Wolf. And I'm Dr. Will B. Join us next week for another Zoe podcast. <laughs> <laughs>